If you're anything like me, you probably don't explore your city nearly enough. I think people grow to assume that there's not much to learn at home, and they'd be better off setting their sights on an interesting city like London or Paris. Unless your home is London or Paris, in which case, lucky you. Truth be told, there's often incredible transit infrastructure or future transit infrastructure, or just infrastructure in general, hiding in plain sight in your city, and it's just waiting to be discovered by you. Toronto has a massive piece of railway infrastructure at its center that is just begging to be used for more than shipping IKEA furniture, phone chargers, and cars. And so the other day, I decided to take a trip to see the legendary Midtown Toronto line. Let's take a look at what I saw and how this line could completely revolutionize transit in what may someday be North America's greatest transit city. So the Midtown Toronto line is owned by CP, Canadian Pacific Railway, one of Canada's two massive freight railway companies. While CP used to use the line for passenger service decades ago, that use case has long been kiboshed. That said, a lot of infrastructure and right-of-way is now oversized for CP, who runs less than 100, albeit long, trains on the double-track line a day. There are tons of cool spaces along this corridor, and I think I hadn't walked around it before because I just didn't appreciate what was possible. It did tend to feel a bit like an industrial wasteland, but the potential here is massive, and there are actually a lot of really nice neighborhoods in the surrounding areas. Now, the absolute pinnacle of the Midtown Line, as I'll call it from here on out, is North Toronto Station. This beautiful station was used for a painfully short time, less than 20 years, and while thankfully it has been retained, it's currently languishing as a liquor store. The building in many ways is even more interesting to me than Union Station. It's surrounded by a mix of different types of development, and the clock tower is incredibly cool. It's also just an old train station, come on. Better yet, Summerhill Station on the subway is just to the north, so it's an easy afternoon trip to check it out. I think it's also a bit of a symbol, that despite what a lot of modern urbanist and transit discussion suggests, North Americans aren't doomed to bad transit and railways forever. We used to be great, and up there with the rest of the world. Not continuing down that path was something we did, and it's something we can undo. A great place to start would be bringing back passenger rail service to the Midtown Toronto line. There are a surprising number of possible transit connections and some major destinations near it just begging for better service, and the DuPont Corridor, which parallels the line throughout much of Old Toronto, is densifying in a big way. There are also other destinations in the area, including Casa Loma, an underappreciated Toronto landmark, the George Brown College campus, and neighborhoods to the north and south. As it turns out, Go and Metrolinx are certainly interested in the Midtown Toronto line, and for all we know, it could end up being an option someday. Go has stated it publicly in the past. While the chance that CP completely gives the line up is probably quite slim, there are somewhat surprisingly no industries or track connections on the south side of the line through most of Toronto. And that means that if the desire was there, Go could easily build two of its own totally independent tracks and stations in the right of way if it shifted the CP tracks north, and this seems like a really promising opportunity for the future. It wouldn't be cheap, and it would probably require corridor widening and bridge expansions in some places, but it would probably be doable. In fact, Metrolinx could even convince CP by upgrading a lot of its bridges, which have seen better days. Next up, let's take a look at where possible stations could be located. Starting from the west, we have Kipling Subway Station, which is also the site of major bus terminals for the TTC, GO, and MyWay, the latter of which opened and we covered at the beginning of 2021. This is an obvious location for a station. Continuing east, the line also runs right next to Islington Station, which probably doesn't make sense with the subway running parallel on this route, but if the area densifies a bunch more, who knows, so I thought it was worth a mention. A station around Scarlet Road in the Lambton area would be my next pick, because it would add service to an area which, even with the new Eglinton Crosstown West extension, will probably be pretty far from rapid transit. Further east, a station in the junction near Keel Street probably makes sense. By the way, if you want me to make another video on the West Toronto Rail Path, let me know in the comments down below. Further east still, I think another station at Dufferin would likely be called for. It would serve the busy Dufferin bus and the major gallery and mall redevelopment. While station slightly to the west on the Barry Line is tempting, this would be really expensive, as with the station intersecting with the Kitchener Line, as this is a future location of the Davenport Diamond Guideway. And I think having less stations is actually an asset here, since for some, this line could operate as an express alternative to Line 2, for a lot of trips in western Toronto in particular, where the lines are often less than a kilometre apart. The next station to the west I'd build would be an interchange with DuPont Subway Station on Line 1, which would be directly connected to the Midtown Line Station. Better yet, I'd place the platform slightly to the west of Spadina so that the western end of what I assume would be a full 300 meter platform would drop passengers two-thirds of the way to Bathurst. 
The station after would naturally be Summer Hill or North Toronto, which would have a direct underground connection to the subway. This would probably be among the most heavily used stations, and so wide passages would be a must. Further northeast, we'd probably continue all the way to Thorncliffe Park, where a connection to the future Ontario Line station could be made. This could be a pretty cool station with an elevated link between the above ground Ontario Line and surface level Midtown Line stations. Subsequently, I'd put a station on the expanded bridge over Eglinton Avenue, with direct connection to Sunnybrook Park on Line 5. A science center station would be neat, but a 500 meter in-station walk would be the butt of far too many jokes. Perhaps at the same time, the Line 5 station could be fixed, finally enabling grade separation and high frequency service all the way to Science Center Station. To the northeast, a new station called Wexford could be constructed at Lawrence and Victoria Park, perhaps with TOD on the old strip mall and car dealership on that corner. This would be useful for diverting passengers from the busy Lawrence bus and the Victoria Park bus from Line 5. Following that, we'd have a newly relocated Agent Court station, which I think could be named Agent Court Collingwood due to its location just east of Collingwood Park. Such a station would be a true cross station, and would tie into the massive development happening in the area. We did just rebuild Agent Court Station, but I think this may be worth it, and perhaps we could use the station building with some smart pedestrian bridges. The last station I'd build is probably the most out there, but I would tunnel the passenger tracks from just west of Midland Avenue with a new station at McCowan Road that would connect to Line 2 at its other end, the terminus of the future Scarborough subway extension. Better yet, the station could be designed with two side platforms prepared for a future Shepherd subway extension east and allowing for cross-platform transfers, which would be awesome and which I discussed in a video. Now, you're probably wondering who would use this line, and so here are a number of trips that would be much better with it. Riding line 2 end to end? It's much faster on the Midtown line, which would have higher top speeds and less stops. It would also probably have bigger and more comfortable trains and much better views. It might even be worth riding a stop or two back on line 2 just for the faster trip. Traveling from much of Scarborough and North York to downtown? Faster to take the Midtown line plus the university leg of line 1 than a trip entirely on the subway. Scarborough to the Science Center or Thorncliffe Park? This would be much faster than using Line 5 thanks to its slow surface section. Scarborough to Bloor Young? Take the Midtown Line and walk or bike from Summerhill South. Switching to the subway could also be attractive if the subway has sufficient room. Scarborough to Yorkdale or Vaughan? Take the Midtown Line and then switch to Line 1 at DuPont and head north. Mississauga to North York? This would quite possibly be the fastest way, riding from Kipling to Summerhill and then riding north as opposed to riding to Renforth and then east and then north. Basically, this line massively improves speed and connectivity to Scarborough, and helps fix a lot of problems caused by this slow surface section of Line 5. Plus, it just generally plays the role of an express alternative to Line 2, and provides a lot of valuable crosstown service. Now, while service on the Midtown Toronto line itself is super exciting, what would be even more cool is running a subway-style high-frequency service on the line with through running onto some GO corridors. What's awesome is that several future lines, and current lines not in the scope of the GO RER plan, could connect beautifully to a future Midtown line, and operate as one of the higher frequency services on the line, Tokyo style. To be clear, I think this is the better approach to take with the Midtown line. Start with a high frequency trunk, and then extend certain trips out onto GO lines. That ensures that there's always a high quality, high frequency service for in Toronto trips, which are honestly the biggest market for this line. We could call such a massive project the Toronto Midtown Express. Assuming we have 20 to 24 trains per hour of capacity on the line, corresponding to a 3 to 2.5 minute frequency, here are the trains I would run. 6 trains per hour from Mississauga City Centre. This would require a couple of grade separations in Mississauga, where some industry connections and grade crossings exist on the line, and I'd probably grade separate the whole corridor, since there are just so few left. It would also require the tunnel spur proposed in the Toronto Regional Board of Trade Regional Rail Report. Some services would head to Union from Mississauga City Centre via a new flyover at the West Toronto Diamond as well, providing a direct connection from Mississauga City Centre to Toronto City Centre. I'd also run three trains per hour from both the Kitchener and Lakeshore lines. The Lakeshore line would likely require flyovers near the ends of the Canpa subdivision. During peak hours, I'd run two trains per hour from a new Bolton line and two trains per hour from the non-diverted Milton line. All other services would turn around at Kipling, which would likely have an additional island platform constructed. On the east, I'd also build the necessary infrastructure to take the Midtown Line all the way back to the lakeshore, via new tracks built in both CP and CN's corridors. This would provide for full through running of the lakeshore line for 3 trains per hour. As an aside, I'd also build a track to connect around the new Agent Court station for some basic service redundancy and equipment moves, but with flat junctions instead of flyovers to reflect the low frequency with which this would be used. As a final lovely addition, I'd reactivate and upgrade the Leaside Spur up to the Richmond Hill line, which I would double track and connect with flyovers on both ends. 
While this would allow some degree of additive peak service with the Bolton and Milton lines, better yet, I think it would be feasible to pair up some of those six Mississauga trains per hour with a new service all the way to the future proposed Bridge Station on the Line 1 extension. The corridor looks wide enough for a dedicated pair of tracks for go on the west side north of the Doncaster Diamond, and all that would really be needed is a smaller scale trench grade separation akin to the West Toronto Diamond grade separation. That said, I'd also want to add new stations at Steeles and Royal Orchard just to supplement the subway connection at Oriole. Now, while all of these services may sound a little bit excessive, I think with smart development and transit-oriented development, they could do very well, especially the services up to Richmond Hill and Mississauga City Center, which have a lot of office space already, and might even need to be scaled up for my initial proposed train every 10 minutes. Perhaps more importantly though, the infrastructure here would make GO's network higher capacity, more flexible, and more resilient. There would be a bypass of Union Station for the critical Lakeshore line should it ever be needed, and a bypass of the capacity-limited Rouge Hill section of the Lakeshore East line that could mirror the Canfa subdivision, which has already been used for services during bridge work and disruptions. Now of course, this wouldn't be an overnight project, or even a few year project, but likely something spread over a decade or two. Fortunately, most projects here have some value independent of the others, so even if everything didn't get done, you'd still have a lot of the benefit. Phasing could look like the following. Start with the Midtown Corridor expansion and high-frequency service from Kipling to Agincourt. Then, complete the tunneled extension to Shepherd and McCowan, the Mississauga Center branch, the Kitchener and Bolton Line connection, the Lakeshore East connection, the Richmond Hill Center connection, and then the Agincourt Southeast curve. I know a lot of this might sound out there, but there's precedent for turning heavily freight-oriented corridors into passenger rail systems, especially if the government gets involved and helps relocate freight to another location. Of course, GO's Lakeshore Line wouldn't be the way it is today if it weren't for the relocation of freight services to the York subdivision. That said, examples like the Moscow Central Circle, which I talked about in a previous video, show that new rapid transit-style circumferential rail routes on converted freight corridors can be incredibly successful. The MCC opened just a few years ago and already carries almost as many people per day as the Bloor Danforth Line. All in all, if we build the current government subway program, RER, and my new Toronto Midtown Express, this would be our network. Impressively well connected, with lots of good redundancy, and with major holes in existing plans filled in. Now, I decided to wait to the end of the video to say it, but this is the start of a new series, Adventures in the City. Now that I'm finally at the center of Toronto, it's a lot easier for me to go on short trips to various interesting infrastructure, public spaces, and transit. Some of these videos will basically be vlogs of me walking around and checking something out, while others like this one will propose ideas and concepts for the future. All of them will be deeply rooted in the city, whichever I may be in at the time. Stay tuned for much more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.